Hello, and welcome to The Psychonaut Show with Dr. J.K.B. This is John K. Burton, M.D., psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And on this podcast, your captain on these voyages to explore strange new worlds in inner space. Our mission is to uncover knowledge that will ultimately make us more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily lives. In this episode, we are going to explore dreams. Now, people are always asking me whether dreams are important to talk about, whether thinking about them is useful. It seems like one of those things like the Oedipus complex that we talked about, one of those ideas from Freud and psychoanalysis that seems very outdated. But here's the thing. We now have plenty of neuroimaging studies of dreaming people, and we know that dreams are important. But for what still remains a question. Humans have thought dreams were important since the beginning of history. In Genesis, Joseph has the famous dream of the 12 fat cows and the 12 thin ones and prophecies for the Pharaoh, the years of famine that put him in Pharaoh's favor. There's the symbolism that we see in dreams. But in this case, it's external to the psyche. Dreams are messages, but the messages don't come from outside us. This is how I think of it. By definition, since we have dreams when we are unconscious, in sleep, they are the thoughts of the unconscious. Freud actually called them the royal road to the unconscious. As opposed to the language of the conscious, which is verbal and linear and logical and rational, dreams are visual and symbolic and illogical and nonlinear and can even be self-contradictory. It's sort of like visiting a foreign country with its own language and culture. Whether you're a Freudian that thinks that dreams represent a repressed wish, or you're a Cahusian that thinks that dreams are serving the purpose of regulating our self-esteem, or you're a Kleinian looking for the aggressive polymorphous perverse meaning, or a Lacanian looking for the wordplay, or a Jungian who's looking for the archetypes, All of these are different languages. And if we can translate these communications from this part of our inner world, we can understand some things about ourselves that only that part of ourselves, that perspective can give us. Now, at this point, I usually give an example. And in this case, I'm going to give an example directly from Freud. And I don't mean one of his cases, but I mean actually from Freud, one of Freud's own dreams. Now, Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams, which is one of his most important works, arguably the most important, in 1900, right at the turn of the last century. Now, Freud had no mean opinion of his importance in the world, and he wrote to his friend Wilhelm Fleiss in 1900, Quote, do you suppose that someday a marble tablet will be placed on the house inscribed with these words? In this house on July 24th, 1895, the secret of dreams was revealed to Dr. Sigmund Freud. And the dream secret was revealed to him in a specific dream that has since become known as the dream of Irma's injection. This was a dream that Freud had himself in which he analyzed and which led him to his theories of the unconscious and repression and dream interpretation. I'm going to use uh, the dream of Irma's injection as an example of how to interpret dreams, using them as an example to illustrate Dr. J.K.B.'s three rules of dream interpretation. Let me say what the dream is briefly. The day of the dream, Freud had received an update from a colleague of his, a medical colleague, on a former patient. And that night, Freud dreamed that the patient came to him and said that she was still having pains, and he blamed her for not having accepted his solution. He examined her by taking her to the window and looking into her throat, in which he saw white patches. He had Three other colleagues also examine her, though they looked different than they do in real life. Freud believes that her illness is because of a bad injection that one of the colleagues, 
the one who updated him in real life had given her. Another colleague says she will be fine. That's basically the dream. So Dr. JKB's first rule of dream interpretation is the Passover question. Now, if you've ever been to a Passover Seder, you know what this is. Why is this night different from all other nights? And what this means is, what was going on in your mind that night that led to the dream? What in particular, maybe something that happened during the day or something that you were ruminating about, what made your mind create that particular dream? Now, Freud called this the day residue. And the day residue functions like sand in an oyster. The unconscious is the oyster. The unconscious is constant. It has our fantasies, our fears, our wishes, always, all the time. They don't change from day to day. They're, they're always with us. But the day residue is like the sand that gets into the oyster, and it creates a particular disturbance that attracts to it the things in the unconscious. It's random, but it has meaning in terms of what it attracts to it. And in that interaction with the unconscious, it creates that particular dream. So tracing back the day residue helps us understand what created the dream, where it's coming from. The dream is just a variation on a theme, the theme being the unconscious. But like in music, each variation helps us to get back to the theme. Let me give you another example of the day residue. So this also comes from a TV show, the TV show, The Young Pope. In the very first episode, it begins with a dream where uh, the Pope has uh, is speaking to all of the gathered masses at St. Peter's Square. And in the show, the Pope is conservative and even a bit reactionary. But this speech is incredibly liberal and talking about how the church needs to change and embrace gay marriage and be okay with masturbation and be okay with birth control. All of the things that the Pope would never do is very subversive, which the unreality of that is what makes it a dream. We understand it's a dream and it must have some other meaning, which we don't really uh, find out what it is, but we know some conflict is going on. But the day residue, the why is this night different from all other nights, is that the Pope has just be, you know, he has just been made Pope and he has to address the crowd. So his expectation of addressing the crowd makes it into that dream. And for the dream of Irma's injection, it is the update from his calling that he has received in real life that leads to the dream about the patient that he got an update on. The dream's primary importance is not about the patient and the update. That's the day residue that gives us the entry into what's going on in the unconscious. It's important to ask this Passover question because it gives us that kind of entry into what is this dream about. So the second rule of Dr. JKB's three rules of dream interpretation is that you are the author of the dream. Every detail, no matter how random or seemingly unimportant or small, was chosen by you for some reason. And that actually also includes dreams that we don't remember that well, that seem very vague. We created them that way. We are the author of the dream. And that's one of the wonderful things about dreams, why they're so useful, is they feel like they're happening to us. But we always know that nothing is happening to us. We're making all of that happen because it's only happening in our minds. That's the feeling that we wake up of, oh my God, thank goodness that didn't happen because it feels so real. It doesn't feel like it's us. And then we are faced with the reality that actually that is what we had. So an example of this comes from a movie that I particularly love, but I don't think it's that well known, but it's called The Young Poisoner's Handbook. And I think it's actually based on a true story about a boy who first poisoned his entire family over a period of time, um, I think it was with antimony, and he was put into a hospital for the criminally insane. He was evaluated and treated by a psychiatrist. Eventually he was let out and then he poisoned other people. But the, the thing that I wanted to bring up is in, in, there's a scene in the hospital. And the idea is this person sort of has a blank inner world. He's a sociopath. 
uh, not that sociopaths have blank inner worlds or anything, you know, that's not necessarily diagnostic or even accurate, but for the purposes of the film and the drama there and understanding rule number two in dream interpretation, it's very useful. What happens is that the psychiatrist, being a psychoanalyst, asks the patient to give him dreams, and the patient doesn't have any, so he tries to make them up. And as is the case with a dream, it's completely transparent to the psychiatrist that the patient is just giving him what he wants and that they're not real dreams, and he comes you know, angry at the patient, he he tells him, you, you know, you're trying to pull one over on me and I can see right through what you're doing and that's because you're a sociopath. So, but the, the main character of the story is very smart. So what he does is he goes to his roommate in the psychiatric hospital and he asks the roommate to give him his dreams. And then he takes those dreams to the psychiatrist because those dreams actually have a real author and they feel real. So that is what allows the dream to seem real to the psychiatrist in the movie. That's what gives them authorship. Now, in Irma's dream, Freud, too, is the author of his dream. Every detail there is something that he has chosen, that the patient hasn't gotten better, that he sees white patches in her throat that there are three other colleagues who examine her and each one is important and also that they don't look like who they do in real life each one of these details he has chosen this is what is called the manifest content of the dream this is something that we create we are the author we wrote it and we have to take responsibility we have to say why did I put that detail in the dream as Freud does? And Freud comes up with his own conclusions about the details that he made, which for him include his discomfort with his own ambivalence about one of the colleagues um, who he respects but maybe didn't do such a good job and he's not comfortable with that kind of negative feeling, so he represses it and that's what comes out in the dream and that leads to some of his theories. So the third rule of Dr. JKB's rules of dream interpretation is you don't have a dream about something you know already. And this one is important. They're all important, but this one in, in particular, because a lot of times people will come to me and say, oh, I had a dream, but I already know what it means, or I already analyzed it. Now you might feel that you know the meaning or the reason for your dream, but you know it in an intellectual way because a dream is like a work of art. It's creative. It's a creative expression. And it always tells you something new because your mind is working on the problem. That's what leads to the dream, like the pearl in the oyster. It's something that isn't solved. It's something that is still in the mind being worked out unresolved. And if you had resolved it, if you know what the issue is you wouldn't need to have a dream about it. So let me give you another example again from a movie. And this one is from the movie A Dangerous Method, which if you haven't seen it, it's about Jung and Freud and a patient that they both treated, Sabina Spielrein, who actually became a very important analyst in her own right and unfortunately was murdered by the Nazis back in, in Russia. Um, but she had some very important and interesting ideas herself that I think are, are underplayed, at least uh, in Western Europe and in North American traditions. But at any rate, in the movie, uh, Freud and Jung are on their way to America, and they share dreams. They tell each other dreams. And Jung tells Freud a dream that he has about approaching the Swiss-Austrian border and being met by an old guard who will not let him come across. And Jung gives his own interpretation of the dream. But Freud says, no, this dream is about me, is about your hostility towards me and feeling like, like I'm holding you back. Now, this was not Jung's idea, but this is Freud's idea. And for the purposes of the film, the dramatization, Freud's interpretation feels more correct. Jung didn't know, wasn't letting himself know that he had these hostile feelings towards Freud. Of course, it was true later on because they had the split that everybody knows about and didn't get along. But in this particular scene, Jung isn't aware of it, but Freud can see it because he can see what 
Jung doesn't know. Jung had this dream that was trying to show himself something about himself that he didn't know and couldn't appreciate until it was pointed out to him. Now, similarly, in the dream of Irma's injection, we might say, well, did Freud know what his dream was about? And he, he certainly said he did, and he certainly came to a lot of conclusions about it, again, that led to, you know, partly led to his publication of The Interpretation of Dreams, which is a seminal work. But later theorists and writers who have thought about this dream have said, you know, Freud didn't maybe say or know everything that he was dreaming about. And they have talked about different theories. Of course, Freud can never be our patient because he's dead for one thing, but also because he just wasn't anybody's patient. You know, sometimes I think of Freud like as in um, the Anne Rice uh, vampire novels, the interview with the vampire and queen of the vampires, that there's this original vampire, Akasha, and she somehow becomes a vampire and then by interaction with her, by drinking her blood, that's where all of the vampires come from. And I kind of think of Freud this way, like, Freud's the original, and he analyzed all these people who then analyzed these other people, and that's how psychoanalysts came into being. But no one analyzed Freud. He was the original. But others have tried to, you know, in retrospect, and have said, you know, he had hostility towards his patient and was angry at her, that there was sort of oral aggression. Some have even said it had to do with his wife and, and her refusing oral sex to him. You know, all kinds of things that have, you know, they're reasonable, uh, they're not um, unreasonable anyway, hypotheses. But the point here is that they're things that people have said, you know, I think this is going on in the dream that Freud never thought of himself. And this goes to rule number three, which is you don't have a dream about something you know already. The dream is telling you something new. And again, it may not be like a new piece of information, but it's definitely like a work of art, putting a different spin on what is going on in your mind. So we've been using Freud's dream, the dream of Irma's injection, to illustrate or look at the Dr. JKB's three rules of dream interpretation. And this dream, of course, was back in 1895, so more than 120 years ago. But let me give you an example from, from now. I was seeing a woman in her 90s at the end of her life. And she told me one day that the prior evening, the prior night, she had had this dream. Her husband, who had died 30 years before, and with whom she was very much in love and admired him greatly, she had a large photograph to remember him that hung in her living room, and she thought about him a lot. In her dream, though, her husband came back from the dead and took her to a restaurant. But it was a bad restaurant, one that she didn't like. And she said in the dream to him, why did you take me to such a bad restaurant? And he said in the dream, because I don't love you anymore. Now remember, the first rule is the Passover question. And in this case, it was because she knew that she was having a session the next day. And her knowledge of that she was going to come in and talk about things that were on her mind and perhaps things that she wasn't comfortable with is what stirred up this dream that was expressing these things that were difficult. And again, the second rule of dream interpretation that she's the author, even though the story was one that was not happy for her, her husband was taking her to a restaurant she didn't like and said he didn't love you. It was she who wrote this story and she had to wonder why would she write a story like that for herself. And then the third rule was that she was learning things through the dream about herself that she wasn't aware of. And in this case, as is often the case, they were feelings that she wasn't comfortable with. And as we explored the dream, we came upon her feeling that she had been abandoned by him when he died. Now, this wasn't conscious. She didn't even feel like it was rational, but she had to acknowledge that somewhere she did have this feeling, which was in conflict with her very positive feelings for him and memory of him. But it allowed her, the dream allowed her to get in contact with a, an opposite feeling. 
and to hold both of them in mind and acknowledge that both could be true. And further, it got to a feeling of worrying about her own mortality, what would happen when she died, and the worry that she would be left alone through death. And this allowed us to explore that feeling, which is normal, but it is also normal for us to have difficulty thinking about it. And being able to talk helped her to deal with her anxiety and understand herself better. So what is the lesson here? It's this. Dream interpretation is not just something that if you're in analysis on a couch five times a week, you tell your analyst, or, and it's not just for prophets, and it's not just for psychics. It's the idea that our dreams are just our mind, the unconscious part of our mind, working on problems that we're working on all of the time. There's the example of the scientist, his name was August Kekule, or Kekule, I think. At any rate, he's the one who came up with the idea in um, organic chemistry of how carbon atoms can link together. And it was in a dream, a dream that he had of a snake biting its own tail back in 1862 that led him to this insight. Now, this is an insight that is of a intellectual nature. It's not emotionally telling him something, though maybe it was, we don't know. But the point of that example is that dreams can give us information that can help us understand things that we wouldn't have been able to understand otherwise. A dream is an act of creation that we all do, and it is from our own unique point of view, and it gives us access to parts of ourselves that are thinking about things in a different way. Sometimes, by nature of the way the dream is, it is, well, in fact, maybe most times, it's difficult to know what is the thing that we don't want to know, but the dream is telling us. This is why it's so useful in therapy, at the very least. But even outside of therapy, when we have dreams, at least considering what is this information, what is the unique perspective that our dreaming minds are taking on what is going on in our lives. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything, and remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O. 